Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And thanks particularly for, to Elizabeth and the other organizers of this workshop for having me here. So um, the reason I guess I've been invited to talk to you is because in the last few years, I've been heading this project, uh, which is funded by the European Research Council. And the motivation behind this project is to try and understand from a qualitative point of view what actually happens when you start to move data around through lots and lots and lots of different infrastructures. And you start to have more and more intermediation steps between when you actually generate a data set and when that data set is being aggregated with other data sets and being reused in a variety of situations. And of course, Pierre's presentation already was pointing to uh, some of these situations. One of the difficulties in understanding how this situation really affects um, what we call science and how we do research is the fact that, I mean, quantitatively, it's very, very difficult to track the data at this point. Um, very often, kind of, for instance, um, ontology websites or data platforms are not really cited in research papers. It's very difficult to actually understand how data travel unless, in fact, you follow the data physically, which is what we tend to do in my group. So what we try to do in this project is to track what we're calling data journeys to really understand how data move from sites of production to all sorts of different sites of dissemination, and particularly data infrastructures, and then sites of interpretation, aggregation, and use. And what are the consequences of these movements? And the approach we're using is an approach that takes tools from the philosophy of science, the history of science, and qualitative social studies of science, so particularly interviews, kind of field work, these kinds of things, to try and understand how that works. We're doing this across in several different subfields, both of biology and biomedicine. And in the last few years, I've been doing also some work on the crop ontology and um, some of the work that you guys are doing. So um, hence this presentation. So what we're trying to focus on is particularly the role of databases. That's where we start from, because they think that there's a very, I mean, they provide a great window on what are really the conditions required to make data fair, to make data reusable. Looking particularly at things like label and software to classify the data. So of course, the focus of ontology is very, very strong in our work. But we also try and look at a lot of cases of data reuse, really trying to see actually when, in which cases are data being um, reused effectively, under which condition this happens, and what does this really mean about our conceptions of what counts as good research at this point in time. And of course, I'm very interested in the role of the open science movement in all of this. So uh, this is just an example of a case I worked on for about 15 years now, been an integral part of a lot of these communities. Um, so this is a case from basic plant science, and the idea is really trying to understand how lots of data produced in plant labs are gathered by databases such as the Arabidopsis Information Resource, which gathers information about the model organism, Arabidopsis thaliana, and then go on to inform all sorts of different visualizations of the data and interpretations of the data, and all the different facilities and groups of people, which actually go in the hundreds right now, that go into um, informing this process of packaging the data for reuse. And one of the interesting things, of course, of this particular um, um, data journey is that many of the resources developed to help the passage of, if you want, more genomic directed plant science are actually, um, in many ways, the models and the forefathers for some of the work that's happening now in the ontologies in, in agronomics. Or anyhow, they're very strictly related. So, I mean, I hope within a couple of years to be able to present something similar for um, what's going on with the crop ontology and all the um, information structure around it. It's, of course, extremely complex because actually these uh, landscapes of infrastructure are becoming more and more layered. So we actually have a side project now also funded by the EU, specifically on how on earth to visualize this stuff. Even for us as analysts of this, it's almost impossible to find good ways to visualize this, which of course raises interesting questions for you in terms of informing people who are using these kinds of data journeys to construct their own uh, data interpretations and their data platforms. So um, one of the roles I've had in the last couple of years also is I'm acting as uh, the open science expert for the European Commission. And as part of that, we produce several reports that are actually informing uh, the open science policy of the European Union uh, at this point in time. And we produce, I mean, I've, I've been part of producing all sorts of other kind of, you know, broad landscape reports on open data, how this intersects with data management and governance, and how that goes into then incentivizing open science activities, how that relates to um, global access to research software and some of the issues with that. 
and how this affects uh, knowledge production. So, I mean, just to give you an idea of the kind of work that we're doing. Now, I think the main um, issue that I've been struggling with and I keep seeing appearing in all the data, the case studies that we looked at so far, including in this community, is of course the idea that you all know this. I mean, you've been talking about this the whole time, and even just this week. The fact that usable data really means trackable data to some extent. You need to be aware to some extent of the journey of the data to be able to reuse them effectively. And that's actually, we have not found an exception to this rule, certainly not in the plant sciences yet. Now, uh, you, that, that, means, that means that you need to be able to access, at least to some extent, the conceptual material and social elements that actually enable data mining and reuse, including the history of the data. Now, I think we've made a lot of progress over the last few years in documenting provenance, and the very work that you are doing is absolutely fabulous in that respect. There is really a lot of different tools that allow you to do this. I think where we're probably still lagging behind, partly because it's so hard to think about how to incorporate that information in ways that is intelligible to users, is actually documenting the processing of the data itself. So one thing is to say, well, data were collected under these conditions at this temperature, in this particular field, in this particular situation. But how do you account for all the different ways in which we then go on to package the data, the ontologies we use to, to do this? I mean, that in itself actually enriches the data, but in fact, it shifts very often the very value that data can have in uh, potential processes of discovery. So how do we make users more aware of that? And that's really the main issue that I think it's, um, it's really central to our work right now. So there's several complications in doing this. Of course, one of the big complications is the landscape of data infrastructures right now is very complex, and I challenge any of you to take out a piece of paper and try to track all the different infrastructures represented at this meeting to, that help in curating um, agronomic data. And you, I, I bet even you will find it difficult. We have found it extraordinarily difficult. And of course that means whenever I go to research users which are maybe not very aware of what's going on and they just try to understand, I, I myself really in difficulty in trying to understand the richness of this and, and to convey that. How do we really um, convey this is a big issue. Um, and of course, partly there is an issue also with sustainability of all of this, because many of the different infrastructures are different funding uh, support. Some of them are outgrowth of individual projects. I mean, it's very, very hard to find some baseline for long-term sustainability for many of these resources. And it's not quite clear which of them is maintained in the longer term, which not. What happens when the resource becomes obsolete or is not maintained properly anymore? What happens to the whole landscape is something that we are, we are trying to clarify. And of course, these are serious issues in terms of intelligibility of these data histories to the users themselves. And one of the things that we've done last year, actually together with Elizabeth and um, Rob Davy from Copo and uh, Ruth Basto and Garen Parry from uh, Garnet, is to try and even just provide a taxonomy to plant scientists of all the different types, not even the actual resources, but types of resources that as somebody working in plant science you'd be wanting to know about at least, uh, to be able to think about curating your data. And as this very, very long list gives you, I mean, this is really a uphill struggle. I mean, even just to classify these in typologies becomes a very complex exercise. Uh, also, another thing that I think may be useful for you to consider, this is very high level, it's not just about plant science. This is a, a survey that the EU has conducted in the last year, uh, looking at how many researchers based in Europe are actually aware of open science initiatives in general, any of those, particularly given that there's been lots of money, you know, including some money in this room, um, given to uh, producing tools to generate you know, interoperable structures, standards, ontologies for sharing data. And one of the interesting results is that when it comes to things like open data, very few people, less than 20%, said that they knew a lot about an initiative in open data. And when they were asked about whether they knew some of the main EU um, initiatives that are supporting, I mean, really providing you the tools, you just go in, like you would go with a crop ontology or with COPO, and you very easily actually can pick up tools that help you to share your data. In fact, almost nobody knew about pretty much any of them. So again, huge gap between trying to do the work that you're doing and communicating it to people who are working on the ground and are not yet involved in this community. Complication two, 
again, I'm tracking the history. Well, I mean, I think very often what we've seen over and over is that reuse of data which has been disseminated in these ways is linked to participating, at least to some extent, in developing the data infrastructures, providing some sort of feedback, being dragged in the process at some point. And in fact, these iterative feedback loops are really the best. And I think the crop ontology is leading the field when it comes to organizing this. The work that you're doing I, at this workshop, I think, is absolutely at the forefront of what is happening in data science in general, in terms of really trying to achieve this. At the same time, there still is confusion around the fact that there's lots of standards around, lots of different models and procedures that are being proposed, that are feeding into ontologies from, and it's very, very difficult to track where they're coming from, what was the original motivation behind uh, their construction, what was their conceptual um, framework within which they were constructed. Um, what does it mean to transfer them from one context to the other? I mean, what are the potential um, theoretical implications? What are the practical implications of that? What assumptions are being made about what counts as a trait, of course, that's the big problem in this meeting, but also disease, pathogens, um, or even just the notion of environment? Of course, you have, you have to black box unavoidably many of these um, terminologies to be able to do the work you do. But then what, what implications does this have? Now, I mean, you all know this very well when it comes to your own resources. But how does that get communicated to outsider? That keeps being the big problem that we see. And third, I mean, I think the, the third challenge, which I'm very, very interested in, is the fact that, of course, particularly the landscape you're working in is a very ethically and socially charged environment. I don't really need to tell you that. It's a translational landscape, which is performed in many hybrid spaces between the world of research and um, and the world of the field and the world of um, agriculture in general. It does integrate basic plant science insights uh, with agronomic research. It's producing some global infrastructures, but done it on a, on a, on a very, very wide um, and diverse audience that goes from farmers to agronomic corporations, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, this means that there's lots of ethical questions whirling around here, which you're all struggling with, and it's difficult to confront systematically. So things like, of course, representation of different cultures, uh, linguistic communities, many of you are very, very deeply involved in trying to confront this and bring these insights into the infrastructure, and that's a huge challenge when producing global infrastructures. Issues around data ownership, very important, particularly when we're thinking about open data. What does it even mean to own data anyhow? Lots and lots of different ideas in user communities around what that means and what kind of rights and entitlements this gives. There's lots of work, of course, on this, but I mean, this still is a big open question. What are the implications or confusions around the issue of data ownership when it comes to things like crowdsourcing or even sharing of data and germplasms from local breeders? What other uses uh, can be done of this data by governments, by insurance company, you name it? Like, and what are the implications then uh, for the field? So in that sense, what does it mean to build in socioeconomic data in something like the Guardian um, you know, infrastructure? Of course, it's a very important idea, but there's always big issues around, okay, what is a solution for which problems, in fact? And being clear about that can probably help thinking about some of the potential kind of downstream ethical implications of this. Also, uh, we have just finished now a project looking at the FAIR principle specifically, and looking at the fact that as much as, you know, we can have a long discussion, and Pierre has introduced it very, very nicely about implementation of FAIR, one of the things that is very clear to us is that the implementation of FAIR principles actually doesn't necessarily have anything to do with fairness in in data practices, right? So actually with having data practices which are accountable, not just ethically, but really socially for the potential implications of that type of data science on um, broader um, social situations. So, I mean, so we, I mean, this, this research is actually coming out of more slightly more biomedical um, related research, but I think it's very, very important to think about this. And in fact, I mean, it's, it's perfectly solvable issue. It's just that by, I mean, as much as it's incredibly difficult to deal with fair principles, they actually don't necessarily help you to deal with that, pro, with that issue. So, I mean, one of the things we've seen very often, I mean, in fact, much less in this community, but I think these are still issues that impinge on this community, are is the fact that very, very many of the databases used to disseminate data actually display outputs of usually top English-speaking labs. They're modeled anyhow on some of those issues. And in fact, that actually goes to some extent also for the crop ontology, where like a lot of that work has come as an inspiration from things like the gene ontology and the plant ontology, which had a very different um, um, origin, really serving top, English-speaking labs. And these labs have funds to curate context. They have visibility to disseminate their procedures. They have the confidence 
to actually share their data and build on data donated by others. This is very different from situations where there is systematic disadvantage, so you have lack of infrastructure, the governmental support, materials, teaching demands, power cuts, all these kinds of things, and where there is vulnerability, for instance, in the sense that what gives competitive edge to a particular research group or, or community is the fact that they have access to the resource and location that others don't have access to. So we've done a big project on this, um, looking at uh, biochemical labs in um, Tanzania, Ghana, and South Africa. The results are available, I'll show you in a second. So this means that there's a lot of reductions actually from low resource community to contribute to uh, data sharing, as you're sure, I'm sure you've all experienced. And some of the researchers involved in this also fear that it will undermine rather than increase their international credibility. So one of the things that we've seen very clearly also is that addressing these kinds of issues, ethical, social, security concerns, actually it may, it may slow down the work you're doing, that's for sure. But actually, it ends up helping with sustainability, inclusivity, and crucially, the reusability of the data sets themselves. And we've seen that in very many um, biomedical experiences of that type, those that didn't do this actually failed dramatically, no matter how many billions of dollars were invested in them. I mean, in cancer, there's lots of very good examples of that. While those that actually took the time to deal with some of this uh, really found that their work was greatly announced and the robustness of the data sources was also greatly announced. I think the crop ontology and many of the initiatives that you're discussing at this meeting have really a potential to be world leading in this way. And this actually needs to be emphasized to the broader community. So just to show conclusions, um, I think it's very, very important to think about data history as actually including the specificity of locations, methods, and interests that characterize you, characterize groups that are actually involved in data processing. And, and this actually really is part of the metadata of the data themselves. Of course, there's big questions around what, how do we represent this, but I think this really should be at the front of our mind when producing uh, data infrastructures. Also, of course, that means, especially for you guys, trying to pay a lot of attention to integrate um, old-fashioned archives, multiple data formats, non-digital sources, different versions of the same software that actually are very important in terms of understanding what work has been done in maintaining data sets, especially as we go into the future and some of the data sources are becoming older. Um, and generally speaking, I think building data infrastructures in that way really is a great way to support critical reflection on what counts as best practice in general, both in research and in agronomy. Who sets the models and the standards, whether they're realistic, and what is the broader impact which is sought? And I just want to thank uh, some of my collaborators, um, Elizabeth and staff at the IITA, particularly Fola, who is here, who have helped me very much in my visit um, in Nigeria uh, this summer, starting some of this work, and these are some of our publications. Thank you. <laughs>